we continue these seminars and teaching about character development. And this week we've been dealing with the basics or the foundational truth, looking at why we need to be trained, why we need to build up character. Amen. We must know that Christianity is not religion. When people talk about different types of religion of the world, they mention um, Christianity. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is Christ's life made manifest. So that's not a religion. Amen? Yeah. It cannot be a religion. will never be a religion. Because it is a manifestation of Christ's life changing the life of God's people. And like we read last class we attended, where Paul was writing to Timothy, talking about the power of God's word, exposing our rebellion. Reading from the Message Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 14 to 17. He says, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Praise the Lord. Training us to live God's way. So, you can't be born again and be the same, and remain the same. It's not possible. That is inconsistent with the word of God. That is inconsistent with God's truth. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That's what Jesus said to us in John chapter 10 verse 10. And because a lot of people don't understand the seriousness of being born again. And so they, they take it as just a ritual. You said I'm born again, and then uh, you, you go about living your life as you used to. The Bible does not support that when you get born again, you can still live the way you used to live. The Bible does not support it. You cannot show any scripture that says that Paul, Peter said we have, we have forsaken all and followed you. Amen. Amen. We have left all. And Paul says all that was gained to him, he counts as nothing because of the high calling. So where does it correspond that you can get born again and live the same life? You see, that is the element that is missing in our modern day Christian belief. If you look at Acts chapter 3, and I would like us to open to Acts chapter 3, and I want us to read something from there. Amen. Verse 19, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Can somebody read that? What did, what did he say? And be what? Converted. Continue. That your sins may be what? Blotted out. And the time of refreshing, come on. So the times of refreshing, refreshing come from the, presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, repent. So that, thank you. You'll be comforted. Amen. You'll be comforted. What does it mean to comfort? <laughs> what does it mean to be comforted? You see, these are the things that we are missing when we get people born again and without demanding conversion. And change. We say you are born again, you can continue to now enjoy the life of Christ. Now, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. It will never work like that. And we, including me, we've been taught like that. And that explains a lot of struggles you have in the church. That, you know, explains a lot of problems individuals have in their Christian work. They say to you, 
When you just come out and give your life to Jesus, you are born again, go about, you can start enjoying the benefit of Christianity. No, sir, no, man. Those things have led to many frustration and people leaving the church. There is a process of conversion. We read it from Romans chapter 12. Paul demanded a transformation. Peter demanded a conversion. Praise the Lord. Paul demanded we renew our mind. So, where did we get this idea of that you just come out and then answer altar call and then you go again and begin to enjoy your life? That is part of the heresy that we are dealing in the church. And so people are not taught, people are not trained, people are not built, people are not changed, people are not transformed. And they miss out. They miss out. Because without conversion, remember what, see, let's this, this read again what Peter said. Verse 19, Acts chapter 3. He says, repent therefore and be converted. The conversions that your sins may be blotted out. So when you, you can't continue sinning and expect your sins to be blotted out. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be what? Blotted out. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of God. What is the time of refreshing? What is the time of refreshing? You see, this is what we are missing. We are missing the refreshing of the Holy Spirit. Or the revitalization of the Holy Spirit. Because, you know, we continue to live our old life in the new creation. And that is a big problem. It is, it is the forsaking of our sin. It is the conversion from wickedness to righteousness that brings a time of refreshing. What, you know, how does the refreshing come? Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That is the refreshing. Praise the Lord. The rest in Christ is a refreshing of our soul. And that is only possible as we abandon our old ways and then embrace the new ways and accept the word of God and commit to the word of God. And then the word of God begin to work in us to refresh us and to revitalize us. Without conversion, there will be no refreshment. Without conversion, there will be no refreshing of your spirit. There will be no refreshing of the spirit without conversion. There will be no refreshing. And it is that refreshing that gives you peace. Where you used to have fear, where you used to struggle, suddenly you have peace. Praise the Lord. We cannot underestimate the effect of change when we believe. And every one of us in this class, and that is why I said, pray the prayer I ask you to pray, and many of you have prayed that prayer. And then when you have prayed that prayer, you key into the word of God, you reset the word of God as you are operating software. As you key into the word of God as your spirit, then the word of God will begin to expose your rebellion and your disobedience. And this is where people don't want to go to. They want to live their lives after they've been born again. But you won't find an example like that. If you look at people like, somebody like Saul, before he got converted on the way to Damascus. Amen. Who was Saul? Saul was a Pharisee. Saul was an extremist. Saul was on his way to persecute, to jail, to arrest, if possible to kill Christians on his way to Damascus. He had an encounter on the way. His mission changed. His purpose changed. So Saul got converted. Saul got what? Converted. And this is the experience every believer should go through. Your purpose changed when you get born again. Your mission changed when you get born again. If before you got born again and you wanted to just make money, you wanted to make money, and by any means you want to make money, and then you got born again, and you still want to make money by all means. You are not born again yet. You are not born again yet. The mission of Saul changed. The purpose of Saul changed. Are you hearing me? The ways of Saul changed. Amen? He was going with hatred and conversion. He was going with love and passion. That is conversion. Praise the Lord. He was going 
to oppose the work of God. When he got converted, he became a promoter and a supporter of the work of God. You cannot receive Christ without a transformation. His name used to be called Saul. He became Paul. What is the difference? What is the difference? Paul means something little. Saul means something desirable, honorable, something princely or kingly. Kingly, let me put it like that. Remember the first Saul? First Samuel, Saul was the first king. And so there was some something to do with, you know, image, highness, honorable dignity. And then when he got converted, he looked at himself that he is the least of the least of the apostles. He wrote it by himself. He reduced himself. He said, Oh, how can I be so? He said, I am Paul now. I am the one that everybody else. He humbled himself. And that is a big compassion from somebody that used to be respected and honored. Somebody that used to be a VIP and all that. And then the compassion, you just dropped. You became nothing. And people don't know that that is the transformation of Saul to Paul. They don't know. And it happened in a moment. It happened within a short time. And so, when you get born again, and you are still full of pride and ego, and you say you are working on this, you are not born again yet. Because when the heart of stone is removed, and the heart of flesh is put in you, and the Spirit of God comes into that, Remember what we talked about, the alignment of our conscience with the Spirit of God. Automatically, you get an alert when you go the wrong way. You get an alert when you go the wrong way. You are conscious with preaching. When they had the Word of God, they were preaching their conscience. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, they were preaching their conscience. You can't be born again and the Word of God not affects you when you hear it. When we get born again, we come alive to the Word of God. We come alive to the Spirit of God. Don't miss it up. Amen. If you are born again and the word of God does not move you, when you hear it, even when it exposes your rebellion, even when it exposes your hardness of heart, if it doesn't move you to repentance, then you are not truly born again. Maybe you should try again to be born again. You should try to be born again. Praise the Lord. Our conscience, our, our spirit is the candle of the Lord that searches even the inward part of a man. It searches, it reveals us. And so, for you to be born again and you are not alive in your conscience or in your spirit, something is wrong. Praise the Lord. And I said to you, when you get born again, you talk differently. You dig differently. You don't talk the way you used to talk. You don't walk the way you used to walk. You don't answer the way you used to answer because the heart that used to do all those things, the person that had used to do it has been crucified with Christ. Amen. That's what Paul talked about to the Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But it's no longer the soul. It is now a transformed all that is alive. We have so many questions that we can ask today in the modern church. Amen. Amen. Why is it that people get born again and nothing happens? I mean, there is no change. Why is it? Because when you are truly born again and you read the word of God, there should be a conviction in your spirit. You mean I used to do like this? I used to hate people. You mean I used to fight people? You mean I used to insult people? Like when we talk about respect. But then I don't blame many Christians because they were not taught. When you get born again, you should know that you respect those that are your elders, that are seniors. You don't talk to them anyhow. You don't answer them anyhow. When you get born again, you don't leave an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. No, that was under the law. That was under the law. Amen. Amen. In the new creation, when you get born again, Paul said, is it, is, it, is it wrong for you to suffer wrong? Paul encouraged us to suffer for Christ. You don't do an eye for an eye. No, you don't do that. And it is this lack of training that has brought a lot of frustration and lukewarmness in the church. Praise the Lord.
God said, talk about me when you sit together with your children. God said, tell your children what I have done for you. The Bible said in Psalm 127 that children are a gift from the Lord. Praise the Lord. And the children are the reward of the Lord. Children are a gift from the Lord. How many times do you sit your children down together and tell them, do you know you are a gift from the Lord? How many times have you spoken to your children over and over and over again that you are a gift and a reward from the Lord? But you will tell them, I carry you nine months only. Are you hearing me? You will tell them, I carried you and you sucked my breast for how many months? Six months. You talk. You only carry them nine months. What about the one that will carry them for the rest of their lives? Have you introduced your children to him? Have you told your children that they didn't come from you, but they have come from God? Shout hallelujah. When you are taught, for instance, I want to show you something. Jesus said to us, praise the Lord. And maybe church don't teach that because they don't want to lose members. But we will lose their souls if we don't do it. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 7. This is coming from our Lord himself. It's coming from our Lord himself. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 7, are we there? Verse 13. And I'd like you to follow me when I read this scripture because it is something that sometimes we don't even consider. We don't look at because we are so, you know, uh, taught about faith and possession and all that and the good things of life in Christ that we forget some of the teachings that Christ himself gave to us. Amen. He says, enter by the narrow gate. Who is talking to us? Jesus. He says, Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. He said, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. There are many that goes by the broad way. That's what Jesus said. Verse 14, and I want you to underline verse 14 before I explain to you the difference between the broad way and the narrow way. He says, because narrow is the gate. Because what? Narrow is the gate. And what? Difficult. I want you to understand the word difficult. Nobody taught me about this. But it is here in the Bible. The way of life is narrow. And Jesus said, is the way which leads to life. And there are few that find it. Wow. The way that leads to life. Jesus said there are few that finds it. Why? Because it is a difficult way. What is a broad way? The broad way is the way that we are coming from. The broad way is the way of liberty. You do what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it. Nobody controls you. Nobody tells you what to do. That was the broad way. Then when you come into the narrow way, the narrow way said to you, the narrow way said to you, now, Walk according to the word of God. Follow the word of God. The narrow way said to you that the word of God is your life. And there are not many ways. Jesus said there is only one way. In the new creation, we don't have multiple ways. Amen. We only have one way. Say one way. One way. And that one way is actually free because there are few that are in it. Are you hearing me? There are few that are what? On it. And Jesus said, beyond that, he said, it's a difficult way. When he says difficult, it doesn't mean that it, it, there is pothole and it is not hard or something like that, from it, apart from it. When Jesus said difficult, see, he said difficult is the way. Difficult is the way which leads to life. You know why? Go back and read what Jesus said in John chapter 
big deal. Amen. Amen. John chapter 15. Verse 1. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Is that in the Bible? Yes, sir. Verse 2. John chapter 15. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear what? More fruit. He prunes. We all know that pruning is not an easy process. What is involved in pruning? Cutting the knife of the gardener, isn't it? Yes. Cutting of the branches. Cutting of the excess leaves. You know, kind of grooming. Amen. Of course, nobody will use a practical knife to cut you and all that. But your character has to be assassinated. That's actually the truth. Your rebellion needs to be assassinated. Your pride needs to be assassinated. Your ego needs to be assassinated. Your tongue needs to be born again. Or sterilized. Your tongue used to be poisonous. When you are a new creation, you need to be sterilized. We can go on and on and on. The way you dress, the way you dress need to conform to Christ. Amen. You don't. Uh, Paul, Paul said to us in, Corinthians, in Romans 12, he says, Do you not do not be like the world? Do not conform to the world. And so whatever dressing you see the world dresses, you depart from it. It's amazing that in church you see uh, ladies with artificial nails so long with multiple colors and all that and all, because they have picked it from the world. These things, listen, the Bible says, let your moderation be known to all men. There are limits to fashion for a Christian. It is there in First Peter 3. There is limits to your fashion. The fact that you can afford it does not mean you should believe it. Amen. Amen. And so, when Jesus says difficult is the way, he's talking about there are conditions, there are requirements in the narrow way. It will condition it will recondition you from the way it used to be. And that's why I said to you that if you go to a church where from time to time the word of God does not convict you, you are in the wrong church. You are in the wrong church. Like someone that was in a Bible school and then after some times went to the lecturer and said to the lecturer, wow, life cannot be any better. And the lecturer said, why? He said, for a long while now, I've not had issue with temptation, I've not had issue with the devil, I've not had issue with this and that. Uh, everything just seems to do kind of normal. And the doctor looked at him and said, son, are you sure you're still born again? Yes. When you are temptation free, we should check if you are born again. No. no. Because difficulty is the way challenges are on our path. Praise the Lord. You said, well, you don't talk to anybody. You don't, you don't relate with anybody, and so that is why you don't commit any sin and all that. Yeah, that does not mean you are sin free. That does not mean you are sin free. What about the meditations of your heart? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Was, it was David that said that. It was David that. Uh, Jesus said to us, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Okay? You don't meet people, but you watch TV. When you watch, what do you imagine? Amen. Did you ever read from Genesis the verses where God said that the imagination and the intent of man is always evil continually? That is God's statement about man he made. And so, there is no man that can say he's sin free. Yeah. That is why we need to be careful. We need to be careful. The Christian life can never be lived in isolation. Otherwise, Jesus would have said, let your light shine before men. <laughs> Amen? It is our living before men that testify who we are. Otherwise, Jesus would have said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. He said, by this, people we know. By this we know that you are what? 
my disciples. Because you live it. Christianity is not a hidden lifestyle. Christianity is a public lifestyle. Let your light so shine before men. Let your light. He said, You are like a city that sits up on a hill. The man, when you are becoming a Christian, you are elevated. People look up to you. People have to see Christ in you. And that is why when we shout, when we yell, when we insult, when we abuse, you know what we are doing? Instead of dispensing the aroma of Christ, we are supporting hell. Without knowing it. Even those that see us living like that, we say, This person says he's a Christian. Amen. The conversion is the attraction. The conversion is what? The attraction. And that's why I said to you that when you become a Christian, the reason why we are having character development is that we are shown that as you get born again, you have zero character. Zero character. Zero character. You need to start that fresh. Like children go to school and learn ABC. You will learn ABC in the Christian, in Christian dog. Everything is different. And the problem is that many of us have lived a Christian life the way we want it, in the lawless manner. And now we are 10 years born again. And when we talk about character, it sounds strange to you because you have lived a life for 10 years or 15 years. But you have been an active Christian because confession has not taken place. You have been an inactive Christian. You haven't lived the life. Amen. Uh, praise the Lord. Remember what the Bible says, and whatever that is not of faith is sin. The Bible says so. Whatsoever that is not of faith is what? Sin. When we get born again, we come to a life of faith. We come to a life of faith. The Bible is clear. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can marry by faith, but you can marry by flesh. That is, there is no third option there. And the sooner we get used to the life of faith, the better our life will become. Seriously speaking, some of the things I know, or I'm teaching now, I wish somebody had taught me this since early as a Christian. I would have been somewhere. Maybe, but we know that all things work together. Praise the Lord. But I wish somebody taught me what I'm teaching you now. Nobody taught me this. But the Spirit now has taught me, and I've yielded myself to learn about it. Because also, I've been frustrated with Christianity that is dormant. Are you hearing me? Christianity that is inactive. You look at yourself and say, if I'm a Christian, why am I not making Why is this? A, why is the weather? Listen, but we cannot walk in the dominion of the light without us jettisoning our own life. We can't. We may not like it, but that's the only way. This is why the way is difficult. Like I said to you before, even from the pulpit, when you wear slippers over a period of time, your leg be like this. Isn't it? When you try to put it into a shoe, you will feel the pain, isn't it? And I said to you, if you used to wear 43, try to wear 41. Then you understand the difficulties of the narrow way. The narrow way takes your spread life, spread life. The life, the way you want it. And what does this narrow way do? The narrow way now will bring it. Bring it into the word of God. Shape it into the word of God. And force you into the narrow way. And there's no way you will not feel it.